Number 200. 200.
Brother Stephen Hall will be bringing our message this morning. I think he told me he was on staff at High Street for 23 years, did you say? And he now goes to Beacon Hill. So uh, we'll turn the service over to him at this time. good to be with you today and I uh, want to commend Brother Brinkley. Uh, not many churches sing every stanza of every hymn that they sing and I do commend you for that. I recall my wife and I and I'm glad my wife Claudia can be with us this morning. Uh, one church that we were in, uh, the pastor insisted that every stanza of every hymn they sang would be sung. And the minister of music, kind of, that was not his thing, so uh, he responded by singing everything as fast as you could possibly sing it. Um, but anyway, I appreciate that, Brother Brinkley. Thank you. And that would be at least in part because of my 50 years of ministry that I spent as a music leader and worship leader and choir leader and all of those things. And I want to bring you uh, greetings also from two of your granddaughter churches. Uh, as you know, this church was the source of First Baptist Church Somerset, and that church has many uh, granddaughters, or daughters, and therefore granddaughters of this church. Uh, served High Street, ba High Street Baptist Church for 23 years, as uh, was mentioned. And that church started in 1915 as a mission of First Baptist Church in Somerset. And uh, when I retired, we moved to Beacon Hill Baptist Church, which started in 1965. And that is also a church started by First Baptist uh, Somerset. And I want to tell you, having served those churches and visited many others, I have great appreciation for this church and for the heritage that you have uh, handed down in this community and also in this county and also around the world through the influence of those who have been part of those many churches. So God bless you and continue to bless you uh, in the future as those ripples, if you will, continue uh, into the future. This morning, the uh, topic that I would like to share with you about is finishing well. Finishing well. Uh, if you want to open your Bibles this morning, I'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to start. 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's first, the second letter to his uh, son in the ministry, Timothy. And we'll begin in verse 6. Paul writes, For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. For the last nine months, 
I've been involved in planning a reunion. Any of you ever had that privilege? <laughs> um, I sang with a group in college. Uh, they called it the Belmont Glee Club, Men's Glee Club. And that group was in existence from 1957 to 1970. And I was one of the last group that sang the final concert in May of 1970, meaning that I, at 75, am one of the younger ones as an alumnus of that group. Um, and I want to tell you, it was a lot of effort to contact those that we were able to contact uh, simply to find addresses or phone numbers or something uh, to get a hold of them and let them know about this reunion. So out of, I think somebody counted 195 names that we have, I was able to contact about 30 or 35 of those. And of those 30 that I was able to contact, 16 of us gathered uh, in Nashville for that reunion on the campus at Belmont University two weeks ago. And that was undoubtedly the only reunion that group will ever have uh, unless somebody wants to be brave and take on the planning this time. <laughs> but there was much laughter and tears and sharing of the stories and memories that we had together and also pay respects to our absent friends. But when I was contacting people and uh, hearing their stories somewhat, I thought of how all of us in that group were nearing the finish line. Uh, you know, the Bible says, uh, Three score and ten, and if by measure of strength, uh, 80 years uh, is allotted. And some people have extra uh, bonus years if you want to think about it that way. But for those of us who are uh, in those later years, there's a lot to think about. Estate planning and wills and all of those kind of things. But the thing that has been on my mind, especially since that reunion, is asking myself the question, can I say with Paul, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. You know, it's, it's uh, great to be a part of a large group that's running a race. Um, I'm not much of a runner myself, but uh, used to run a little bit when I was younger. But recently, uh, watching all the fundraisers and the other groups that do these uh, runs to raise money and so forth. Uh, it, it's interesting to see how many people actually come out for that. And some of them are there to run and win, and some of them are there to walk <laughs> and make it to the finish line. But the point is, regardless of how you start, the point is to finish the race, is it not? A uh, number of years ago in the Olympics, and I, I didn't write his name down, but I've seen the video several times and it, it's so strongly uh, imprinted on my mind. A young man was running in one of the distance races. And so as they came into the stadium for the final laps of that race, he was running well, but he pulled a muscle 
in his leg. And he could not continue. And out of the stands, all these thousands of people in the stands, out of the stands came a man who turned out to be the runner's father. And he put his arm around his son, and his son put his arm around his dad's shoulder. And they walked the rest of that race. Because the important thing for his son was to finish that race. Even if he had to have help to do it. And that's one thing I want to encourage us about uh, today is that we do have help to finish the race. We're not out there struggling along on our own. We have someone to help us. If you look at Hebrews uh, chapter 12 and verse 1, the author encourages us, exhorts us to run the race set before us. And then he says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In other words, we're not out there running all by ourselves. We have the author and finisher, the one who started us in the race and the one who is in fact the goal, the prize of the race with us in that process. So let us be encouraged that in running the race of faith, we have someone there with us. And also let us be encouraged by Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Chapter 1, verse 6, very familiar words. Paul says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. Now, Paul is uh, not just suggesting that those who have started in this race with Christ uh, have a good percentage chance of finishing the race. He's saying, I am sure of this. I am confident of this, that he who began the work will bring it to completion. The good work Paul refers to is the work of salvation, that God works in the heart of every believer through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. And aren't you glad that when God saved you, He already had a plan for your life? I know I am. I'm so glad that he knew me in my mother's womb and was already preparing a plan for me. Even as I developed into a helpless baby who could do nothing for myself, let alone plan a future. But God had all of that in mind when we came to be. So I must ask you today, has God begun a work of salvation in you? That is the first question we must answer in running the race. Do you have confidence that he is working in you now to complete this race, even as you go about your daily tasks. My brother, uh, who is no longer with us, at one point in his life as a college student, took a uh, job as a church custodian. 
And when he and I would talk about it, he said, well, you know, I'm cleaning toilets for Jesus. Well, that's life, isn't it? But the things that we do, the tasks that we have in our lives are not the goal. The goal is to finish the race, to complete that which was begun in us. Do you look forward to the day of Christ? Do you look forward to the return the, to this earth when he comes in all his glory with his angels and the saints of every age? I hope you can answer those questions with a resounding yes. But if you can't, Please don't pass up this opportunity to invite Christ into your life and begin that work today. The scripture is clear that God has one plan for every believer. You say, well, how in the world can that be? How many millions and millions of people are there who have lived on the face of this earth? How can God have one plan for all of us. Well, because he knows that that one plan is exactly what every person needs. And what is that plan? God's plan is to conform us into the image of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean he wants us to be little robots, you know, wind us up, set us off and all that. Or bobbleheads. You ever had a bobblehead that, you know, looked kind of weird? Absolutely not. God knows us so intimately from the inside out and exactly, he knows exactly what circumstances must be brought to bear on our lives to accomplish that goal for all of us. And Romans 8, 28 through 30 is a very familiar passage. And if you want to turn there, that's fine. But most of us can quote at least part of it from memory. Here again. Apostle Paul is writing this time to the church at Rome. And he says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified now right there you have in a capsule the whole plan of God for a believer's life that we be conformed to the image of Christ and even though we face difficult circumstances sometimes horrendous circumstances in our lives the whole point of those circumstances is to conform us to that image and God will accomplish this. And in the process, he will bring us through all of these passages on the journey so that we may be presented before Christ as trophies of his grace. Now, when we think of these verses that I've just read so many times we're satisfied to just shortcut it and just say well you know God works all things together for good you know what's wrong with that 
That's only part of the story. If you stop there, you have left it hanging unfinished because Paul is very clear that for those who love God, he works all things together for good and for those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose for us? I've only said it about five times already to conform us to the image of Christ. But you know, people who do not love God should not expect all things to work together for good. Sometimes the things that happen to them are like a huge stop sign. Human beings are notorious for running stop signs. And sometimes things that happen to those who do not know God or love God, even though they leave the scars, when they do come to Christ, those scars are reminders of His love. Because He has called us according to His purpose. Now we can easily see God in this context as a master potter. Have you ever watched a potter take a lump of clay and throw it on a wheel? Start that wheel spinning. And that wheel has to spin at just the right number of revolutions for him to complete his work and to do what he has in, already in his mind. The design he wants from that lump of clay is already there as he throws that wet mass on that wheel. And with expert hands, he begins to put pressure here and pressure there. And as that wheel spins, that lump of clay begins to take shape. And as it's shaped, sometimes he has to put a little more pressure here, less pressure there. And sometimes he takes, stops the wheel, takes that lump that he's been shaping off of there and just puts it back in the water and starts all over again. Now that is not because his plan was messed up or even the process that he has used was wrong, but because the clay refused to yield to the master's hand. So by putting it back in the water and hopefully uh, adding more moisture to that clay, he begins again. And eventually, out of that lump of clay comes a beautiful vessel shaped for a specific purpose and useful to the master potter. And so it is with God. God uses all kinds of circumstances in our lives and sometimes painful to us and harsh in our view to mold us and conform us to the image of His dear Son. Do we understand what He is doing when we are in the middle of that difficulty? I know my wife and I have prayed a number of times, Lord, help us to learn what it is this time. We don't want to go through this again. But even so, even when we are focused on our pain and our loss and our discomfort so much that we cannot see what He is doing, God is at work in our lives with one purpose. One purpose. 
C.S. Lewis, the great uh, British Christian author, has said it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasures and shouts in our pain. Can you relate to that? I can. God is relentless in carrying out his plan for us because he wants the best for us. And if he wanted anything less, we would have grounds to accuse him of playing favorites with his children. But God is not that way. He doesn't choose favorites, but he knows his children well enough to know how to work with each one of us. If you're a parent and you have more than one child, you know every child is different. And to discipline that child, you have to be very sensitive to the differences between the children. You can't, you know, I've heard parents say, uh, I don't understand what went wrong with that when I raised them all the same. Well, there's your problem. You can't raise them all the same because they're not the same. So at the beginning of this message, I read Paul's words to Timothy. And if you want to, you could think of those words as Paul's epitaph. That writing on his headstone that says something about his life. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. You may have even seen those words on tombstones in cemeteries like the one you have out here. If I were to choose my own epitaph, I would choose something like this. He was the very image of his big brother, Jesus Christ. That is God's goal for us. And we can make it ours as well. There's a story I like to tell. It's a revised telling of a story by Nathaniel Hawthorne that was called The Great Stone Face. And it seems that in a small town in a deep valley lived an old man. He had spent his entire life in that place. And above the valley was a great boulder on the mountain. And on that boulder was the face of a man. And the story was told, and he heard it all of his life, that one day a great man would come to that valley. And his face would be the face on the boulder, the great stone face. And he resolved in his mind that he wanted to live long enough to see that great man come to his valley. Well, as the years went by, the man grew old. He had married, he had children, he had grandchildren, all in the shadow of that boulder. And every day when he went about his work, his tasks, he would look up and see that great stone face on the side of that boulder. One afternoon he sat on a bench outside his house talking with his youngest grandson. And he said, my son, have I told you the story of the great man who will come to our village. And the lad replied, yes, grandfather, many times. And he said, good, good. Let me tell you one more time so you will remember 
all of your life. As the sunset began to wane and darkness crept up the valley, the grandfather told him one more time about the great man who would come and his face would be the face on the boulder up above them. And as the young boy listened, he turned his gaze to the mountain and he looked at that boulder. And then he turned once again and looked at his grandfather's face. And he said, Grandfather, your face is the face on the boulder. You are the great stone face. And the old man could not believe it. So he rushed into the house and he looked in the mirror and there reflecting back to him was the face he had seen every day of his life. His face had become the face on the mountain. Now I close with one last verse of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. To finish well, we must keep our eyes on the prize. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. We pray with me. Dear Father, we are once again so thankful, so grateful that in your great wisdom you have made a plan for each one of us. And that plan is achievable for all of us, not through our own strength, not through our own striving, but in your grace to complete the work within us that you have begun through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that we may be made in his image and that when he returns, we will be a reflection to him of that grace, of that glory that you have bestowed upon him. As we reflect on that, may we take it as a challenge to our lives to finish the race, to finish well, and to receive the prize, which is your Son. Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Number 275 is the stand. 275.
מרים? Thank you. 